margins that are not ideal, you'll have bacteria in the tooth, even if you don't actually see signs of it clinically or radiographically. So the whole reason you replace the restoration would be the reason why you should redo the root canal filling. You look at a, a tooth like this one, think to yourself, is that a good root filling? Doesn't look too bad radiographically, does it? How about this one here? Well, there are two here. Let's just look at this one here that's got the post. How about the root filling in that tooth? Yeah, you're saying, what root filling? They're the same tooth, one year apart. What's happened here? Did the dentist pull the root filling out when he did the post? Maybe. But no, that root filling's just washed out because it was just a paste, cry paste. Some of the older people in the room might be familiar with the name. It looks nice radiographically, just looks like gutta perca, but it's just a paste. So probably when he was doing the post, he did wash out a bit of it, but it was going to wash out anyway. So you can't rely on your radiographic assessment of a root filling. All radiographs tell you about a root filling is how radiopaque the material is and where it's been placed. They don't tell you anything about apical seal, coronal seal, lateral seal, whatever seal you like. They don't tell you anything about bacteria in the tooth. And when you look at radiographs, remember all you're seeing is a buccolingual view. It'd be really interesting if you could take teeth out and turn them around the other way and then take a radiograph. Because a good root filling can be a pretty bad root filling when you get a better view of it. And you know, don't think just because you do one technique that you think is great that your root fillings, well hopefully they're a bit better than that, but they're certainly not going to be looking like that when you turn them around 90 degrees and take another radiograph. And bacteria don't need this amount of space. They only need a little bit of space. They're quite happy inside dentine tubules, let alone inside a big root canal. So radiographs don't tell us much about it. And also, just because you don't have a, radi a radiolucency does not mean you don't have an infected root canal system. Have you ever thought, how long does it take for a radiolucency to develop? And it's a really good question. And the answer is, we actually don't really know. And particularly for any, any particular patient or any particular tooth, you don't know when it starts, because you wouldn't have been taking radiographs every few weeks just to check the tooth. It's not realistic. But we do know from research such as this paper here, where this was a monkey study where they um, infected canals and then followed them up radiographically and histologically. In the group where they left the access cavities open to the mouth, it took at least seven to 10 months for a radiolucency to develop after they put bacteria in the canal. The ones where they put a temporary filling after a couple of weeks, um, so they put bacteria in the canal, left it open for a couple of weeks, then put a temporary filling in. They took at least four months for the radiolucency to show. So radiolucencies take some time to develop. In other words, your root canals are infected for at least several months before you're aware of it on a radiograph. And obviously there'll be differences between patients and between teeth. So the absence of a radiolucency does not mean the absence of infection within the root canal system. So you should take a, a, a cautious approach and retreat before you restore again. So if you do have a radiolucency, yes, you do have inflammation. If you don't have a radiolucency, you may or may not have periapical inflammation. So back to that case I showed you where we're treating this uh, um, tooth here. When the patient came back after I did the initial treatment, I was going to do the root canal filling, she had a crown on the tooth, despite my advice to her and to the dentist. And look what's happening. We're getting a radiolucency developing there. This one's looking good, it's healing. Anyway, we continued to monitor, and to me that radiolucency is just very, very gradually starting to increase in size. I don't have any further follow-ups because she didn't come back to me because she didn't like the idea of having to have that tooth retreated. But one day it'll have to be done by someone. So the absence of a radiolucency does not mean the root filling is okay. If it's an old root filling, redo it. Even if it's a relatively new one, you're safer to redo it. 
because to retreat this is much, much more complex than to retreat this. Yeah, I can do that one really easily. This one, I'm going to get the crown off, get the post out, get the root filling out, hope that the tooth is okay to restore again, and so on. Much more costly, much more involved with treatment. So let's look at how we can do some of that. We have a canal that has some rubber and some cement or whatever else has been used in the canal. The rest of the treatment is exactly the same. So you still have to go through your examination, remove all the restorations and caries and cracks and see if the tooth is okay to treat. You have to locate the canals, that's probably easier because you can see the material in there. Um, we get that out, we put our initial dressing and normally I would do a 50-50 mixture with uh, Letamex paste and calcium hydroxide because usually we're dealing with infection and inflammation. Build up a restoration at the first appointment and the second appointment I would cut through that interim restoration, get my working lengths, clean the canals out. Second dressing or dressing at that second appointment would be typically calcium hydroxide because that has your best antibacterial action. Temporary filling, leave it for another month or so. And uh, if everything's okay, we'd do the root canal filling. If we have, say, a large radiolucency, we might choose to do a number of dressings or maybe even just one extra dressing before we do the root canal filling. So no difference except there's a root canal filling material in the canal. The rest of it's exactly the same. So how do we go about doing that? A lot of these teeth will have crowns and posts on them, not all of them. Um, so I'll just show you a few ways that I go about some of these things. So let's start off looking at how do we get the crown off a tooth. There are devices you can get. Um, this device didn't extract the tooth, it's just a tooth I found in our collection. It's a good little device, it's called the auto abdicator. It's good because it actually grips the crown on two sides. And in this thing here, there's a spring-loaded device and it's, it's about, probably close to about 20, 25 centimetres long when you put uh, this onto the end of it there. So it's a bit big and a bit sort of frightening for the patient, but it works really well at times. When you turn the knob here, the spring-loaded device there sort of creates a bit of a jolt and uh, the crown pops off. That's if you can get the thing under the margins. So it works, but not always. It's sort of similar in a way to this thing here, which uh, you might be more familiar with, the uh, Ascolap crown remover. The disadvantage with this thing, uh, and there's another sort that doesn't have a spring where you do it manually, and that one's a lot longer. The disadvantage with this is that you're only levering off on one side. The unfortunate thing is you can't buy this thing anymore. But I'll show it to you because it might be of interest. And uh, if anyone has got one, it's going to be worth a lot of money if you try and sell it, particularly if you can find an endodontist, a uh, young endodontist who's looking for a bit of equipment. But these things here you might be more familiar with. The disadvantage, as I said, is that you're only levering off one side, and when you do that, you may crack the tooth underneath. So I'm not a fan of those instruments there. Um, what I prefer to do is, if, if the auto abdicator doesn't work, and it will only work on anterior teeth, you just cannot get it in the posterior part of the mouth. Um, and it really only works if you can get under the margins. I guess sometimes you can cut a little groove there if you want to, but uh, I prefer not to do that because you can actually um, destroy the tooth a little bit around the margins. So if it doesn't come off with that device, and for all posterior crowns, I'll cut them off. And to do that, I cut a groove down the buccal surface across the occlusal and partway up the palatal side. And the burr I like to use is this one here. It's a beaver burr, 1931. Uh, it's a tungsten carbide, but the flutes are a little bit um, bigger, if you like, compared to your standard tungsten carbide. And I use that beaver burr to cut through the porcelain, and then the other one, the Jet 331, to cut through the metal. So you can see this is a high powered view there, it's a bit more serrated there, so it tends to cut porcelain a lot more effectively than this one. And this one is much better on the metal. Not a diamond. If you want to cut, use tungsten carbide. If you just want to abrade, use diamond, but abrasion takes a long time. You know, if I want to cut a groove in this bit of timber and I get a diamond file, it can be there for a long time, I get a saw and cut it. It's a big difference between diamonds and tungsten carbides. There's also this one around I've had for a couple of years now, which the manufacturers tell you cuts anything. 
It's not quite true, like most things manufacturers tell you. It's, it's okay on some porcelains, and you know, these days we have some porcelains that are really hard to cut. Um, it doesn't work very well on those really hard porcelains. It works pretty well on older type porcelains, but pretty much anything does really. Um, it's, sort of, it's called a talon burr. Uh, you, you might want to try it. So what we do is cut down the buckle surface across the occlusal, so you can see here, down the buckle surface across the occlusal, and then we don't go all the way through on the palatal or lingual side. We go part way down, and they're very bit down towards the margin. We just thin it out a little bit. Because then what we're going to do is use this instrument here. I usually use the straight one, the Christensen crown remover. You can get a right angle bend or a straight one. The straight one tends to be easier to use. And we place that into the groove on the buckle, and that's what it looks like on the end. Okay, so you want to hook this end into here, and you give it a bit of a twist. It is back and forward. And what you can use is use, I call it walking the crown off the tooth. So it opens the margins up. So effectively, it's sort of like opening a, a tin or something. You open it up and the thing just walks off the tooth. If you cut right through on the palatal, when you use this instrument, what will happen is half of it will come off because it levers against the other half. Okay, so don't cut right through and just thin it out a little bit so it's a bit thinner and the metal will bend then. Um, if you do, um, one where you have cut a bit too far through and only half comes off, then you're going to have to cut another groove, say, across the occlusal and try and lever it that way. So it just takes a lot longer. There you see the um, lingual side of it there. So we've just thinned it out a little bit. And usually what happens as you uh, use that Christensen crown remover, the porcelain just tends to crack off. But that's okay because the thing's going in the bin anyway. You can't use it again. Same if you're cutting off a bridge, we'll do the same at each end of the uh, bridge and then take them off. So that's fairly simple um, and it's pretty quick too. Usually only takes about five minutes or so, unless you've got one of those really hard porcelains. There are other devices around, like this one here. Has anyone tried this, the WAM key? I can think of another name for it, but uh, they, you know, it sort of sounds good in principle. But, yeah, lots of things are not as good as the manufacturers tell you. When you really think about it, there's a lot of problems with this device. The principle is you have this instrument that has this end to it. So you can see there, there are different sizes, but it's sort of, it's not a circular in cross section, it's sort of oval shape. And the idea is that you cut a hole through the crown, so say from the buckle side, and uh, you make the, the hole sort of an oval shape as well. And then you place your device into that hole and you give it a bit of a twist and it lifts the crown off. Yeah, sure. For a start, how do you lift it off when you've got this instrument stopping it here? How do you know where to make the cut so that you're just on the tooth there? How do you know how thick the crown is? You know, I take crowns off where sometimes the porcelain and the metal is like three millimetres thick. Other times it's, you know, a millimetre. How about in anterior teeth? Where are you going to cut? Yeah. As I say, things often sound a lot better than they are. And then what's the point of it anyway? You're taking a crown off, you're not going to use that crown again, or you shouldn't use it again. If the crown needs to come off because it's no good, it's no good. Don't stick it back on again and hope that your composite or your glass on or whatever else you put underneath the crown is going to do the job. It won't. It certainly won't for any length of time. So. Don't be afraid to destroy the crown when you take it off. And even if you did put this back on, what are you going to put in there? It's never going to look as good as it did originally, and for anteriors in particular. So, you know, don't get conned by these things. The simple way is to cut a groove through it. Christensen crown remover, a really simple instrument, um, will get off any crown you want without any other devices. Okay, so how about posts? So this one here is a cast post. It's an upper premolar, so it's a little bit hard to get to. You can use various devices, but um, some of them are not available and some of them are very expensive. We'll start off with this one first. This is one that's not available. So again, if you've got one of these things, I can probably give you the name of about 20 or 30 endodontists who'll buy it from you. Uh, and you can name your own price because you cannot buy it anymore. But if you do have one in your practice, uh, keep it because it's really useful for cast posts. 
The idea is you've got to cut the core down so you can get the device to fit on. So you know, if that's your typical core shape, you've got to cut it down to about, about two millimetres, sort of like a cube shape, so that your uh, labial and your palatal surfaces are more or less parallel. Doesn't matter if they're a bit rough and undercut, that's good because you get a bit of friction. And your mesial and distal surfaces need to be parallel as well. Because you're going to put the device on here and it will grip on the labial and the palatal side with these curved arms. And then what we're looking, if you look straight on there, is a straight arm. The straight arm will come down on the mesial, another one on the distal, and push off the margin. It's a bit like a corkscrew sort of thing. Except a corkscrew, you screw it into the cork. This thing, you, if you imagine a cork part way out of the bottle, you grip the top of the cork and you push off the, the rim of the bottle. Works really well, but, and particularly in anterior teeth. Sometimes you can use it in a premolar as we did here. So we've got the crown off, that's what the core looks like. We cut that core down so the device will fit on it. And then we've got the device on here, so we're looking at the curved arm here on the, on the buccal side, and on the other side, the other curved arm is gripping onto the palatal. You screw that on really tightly and then, then you wind the other knob down which will move this side arm down here and on the distal and you start to see the core and post come out of the tooth and there it is there. So it is a useful device if you've got one. If you don't have one, bad luck, send it to someone who's got one or you can try something like ultrasonics. Ultrasonics work really well for things like parallel sided posts. You can use them for cast posts, but it will take you a lot longer to get it out. The idea of using ultrasonics, and, and the best sort of tip to have is one that just has a flat surface to it, sort of like a, almost like a screwdriver, if you like. When you apply your ultrasonic <laughs> instrument on one side of your post and core, the energy is going to be breaking down the cement on the opposite side here. So we typically will put that onto the buckle and leave it there for maybe 20 or 30 seconds. Then we'll put it on the palatal side and that's gonna work here and break down the cement there, 20 or 30 seconds. Move it back to the buckle, 20 or 30 seconds. Palatal, 20 or 30 seconds. And again, and again. And you get to the point where the thing starts to lift out. Think of the shape of most canals, they're oval shaped, with the longer axis being labiopalatally, shorter axis mesiodistally. Well, the, you put a round post in an oval shaped canal, on the long axis you're going to have more cement. So you're trying to break down that cement. On the mesial and distal, that's where the post probably touches the dentine. So there's no scope for it to vibrate loose. So you've got to break down the cement, so that's mainly, as I say, labial, and palatal, and you create a bit of space for the post to start moving. What you're effectively doing is moving the fulcrum point from here part way down the tooth, and as you start to see a bit of movement, you keep going labial lingual, labial lingual, the post starts to move more and more, and then almost floats out of the canal. So ultrasonics, if you don't have anything else, you, you can still get out a lot of posts if you've got a good ultrasonic unit. And, and you need a piezoelectric one, not the old um, Cavatron style. It just doesn't have enough power to, to de deal with it. Um, the other device, which I wouldn't suggest you run out and buy this thing, but uh, certainly if you're an endodontist, I'd tell you to get one because they do come in handy from time to time. But we don't use it that often. Um, it's called the Mazaran kit. And this is a series of hollow burrs, or trephine burrs, if you like. That's what it looks like at the tip. And the idea of this thing is that it rotates anti-clockwise and can cut around a post. But it needs to be a parallel sided post to do that. And it's particularly useful when you have a fractured post like that in the canal, or this one here. The idea being that you cut a channel around the post, with the, you pick the burr that fits over the post, so it's just cutting the, they say the cement, but inevitably you're gonna cut dentine as well get it to sort of this point here and then they say you get the smaller instrument and push it down over it and it grips on and pulls out. Yeah, sure, that doesn't happen. But um, by doing this and using it in conjunction with ultrasonics, so we'll drill a little bit with the Mazarin, 
ultrasonics, so we create a bit of space to be able to put the ultrasonics on and vibrate it loose. So we tend to go Mazarin, ultrasonic, Mazarin, ultrasonic, Mazarin, ultrasonic, and fairly quickly these things will come out. Um, so combining the two there. And that's just a larger view of that one. There's another one there where we've removed the post. One thing I will say is never, ever, ever, ever try to drill out a post. This picture here, apart from the Red Cross, because I put that there, this picture comes from a textbook, and I can't believe that anybody would publish that. They say, get a little fine round burr and drill down alongside the post. Others you'll see will use, say, get a high speed burr and drill the post out. That's a really good way to destroy the tooth. Do you really think you can get a high speed burr, stick it on the end of a post down inside a root canal and only cut the post? You know, think metal, trying to cut metal, what often happens? It slips, you gouge into the tooth. Or if you're doing this, you're just creating a much bigger hole and you most probably have a tooth that you can't restore or you shouldn't restore afterwards. And here's an example of a patient that I saw a number of years ago now, um, broke the post there, dentist tried to drill it out. This is when I saw her, this is the dentist radiograph. And look what he's done. We did get that out, but just look at how the thing's been destroyed because he's been trying to drill it out. And that tooth had to be extracted. You can't, you can't restore that, particularly as an abutment tooth, and expect it to last. It's going to snap. So um, it shows you the value of a good radiograph too, because here you can't see the radiolucency, but here and here you can. This is just elongated, so you lose all the detail. Now, posts come out fairly easily if you know what you're doing and you have the right devices. And for, for me, Egler is the best device for a cast post what we tend to use in anterior teeth. Uh, sometimes we'll use ultrasonics. Ultrasonics are great for getting out parallel posts. And sometimes we'll use the Mazaran, particularly if it's a fractured post. And sometimes, particularly when we use the auto abdicator, we'll get the post out with the crown. So it's not, to me, it's not such a big deal to get posts out. It's not that hard. Many people get worried about, firstly, getting the post out, and secondly, fracturing the tooth root. I've done two reviews of uh, our cases and one was looking at 234 teeth. We got all the posts out and no root fractures. And the other was a bigger study where we had 1500 posts and only one fractured. And I blame myself for that because I think it was poor case selection. I shouldn't have tried. It was a tooth that probably should have been extracted without even trying to get it out. Anyway, we, we tried. That was when I was young and enthusiastic and not so experienced and you try to do these things, but you learn from, from that. So yeah, every now and again, poor case selection post may lead to the tooth breaking, but the tooth was probably no good anyway. And it doesn't take long. Of those 234, you can see that uh, the average time was about six and a half minutes, but the most common time was three minutes. Some took a bit longer, up to 30 minutes. Some didn't take any time at all because they came out with the crown. So it's not a particularly difficult or time-consuming procedure, but it does mean you've got to have the right equipment to do it. If you're just limited to using ultrasonics, it's going to take you longer than if you had, say, an Egler and so on to do it. But you can still do it. It's just going to be longer time. You've got to be patient. So once you've got all you know, your crown and your post out and the caries and check the tooth for cracks, that's when you should assess whether the tooth is OK and should be extracted. So that's your time when you really assess the long-term prog long prognosis of the tooth. So for example, here this uh, crown and post has been removed. There's enough tooth structure there to restore it again. Same with the other one there. So keep on going. This one here, we thought there was enough tooth structure there to restore, so we keep on going. This one here, look at the premolar. This was one of my postgrad students. I think if I'd been treating this case, I probably would have said don't bother at the start, but postgrad students are enthusiastic too. And sometimes it's the patient. And in this case, it was more the patient that wanted to really try and save this tooth. So he removed the, the bridge and the post and core. And that's what's, when you get the, the um, post out there, that's what's, sorry, the post is out here. That's just not enough tooth structure to restore. It's quite subgingival. It's 
certainly not good enough for a bridge abutment, so that tooth was recommended for extraction. So that's where you decide whether you keep going or not. Um, you look for things like cracks. No point taking that root filling out when you see a crack like that. Take the whole tooth out. So if the tooth is okay, then you need to remove the root canal filling. How do you go about doing that? Well, there are many different descriptions of how to do it and many different instruments that are being produced these days. I like to keep it simple. Everything I do, I like to do simple things. There's much less problems when you do that. The first thing I would say, if you have a tooth that has gutta perca in the pulp chamber, use some heat to get rid of it. So if you've got something like this here, where that whole pulp chamber, who knows why the dentist did it, but actually makes the retreatment simple because you just use a bit of heat with something like a, a Glick number two endo spoon or some old spreaders like these ones here that are broken. You can use them as instruments that you can heat up and you can plunge it into this material and remove it. So have it really hot. I prefer the, the endo spoon, really hot because you can go in there and scoop it out. So that really applies just in the pulp chamber to use a bit of heat. Once I've got to the root canal, and in most cases you don't have that GP in the pulp chamber, so it would be straight to this point here. The simplest instrument to remove most of your gutta perca is a Gates Glidden Burr. Um, this is a three, this is a two. It, the size you choose will depend on how big the canal is and how big it's been prepared to. Now, you may know that, you may not know that. Most cases you probably don't know that because um, it may have been done elsewhere. But it's a little bit different when you retreat to when you treat a tooth the first time. When you treat it the first time, the canals are narrow. When you're retreating, the canals have already been enlarged for you. So instead of starting with a small instrument because you want to work your way down to the apex, as you do the first time you treat it, start with a bigger one because you've got to remove the material from the wider part of the canal, the coronal part. So typically I would start with, say, a three. And I'll use the gates gluten three just a few millimetres into the canal. If it's a really big canal, say it's an upper central in size, it might have been done when the child was young, we might start with a four or a five. So look at the radiograph and make a judgement and look at the canal when you actually get to it and see what, sort of, what size burr is likely to fit in there. So typically, let, let's say it's a molar tooth, I'll start with a gate gluten number three and I'll use that for two or three millimetres into the root canal. That's the widest part of the canal. The gates gluten is really good because remember it has a non-cutting tip to it. You put that tip onto the gutta perca, you start the motor running and you run it at a sort of reasonable speed, not real fast but certainly not slow, it'll generate heat. What happens when you generate heat? You soften it. And so just put it on the gutta perca, start your handpiece running, and within about sort of 10 seconds or so, you start to feel that gate gluten sinking into the GP. And you'll see bits of it coming out because the, the flutes of it will bring the gutta perca out. Then I'll go to the gate gluten number two, and I'll use that for another three or four, maybe even five millimetres, as far as it wants to go. It'll go until it feels resistance from the dentine as the canal curves. Don't force it, just let it go. Let it do the work itself. The heat it generates, the cutting action, it'll work, but it won't cut dentine unless you force it. And if you do that, you're either gonna go off and maybe perforate, or you might break the instrument. So don't force it, just let it go where it wants to go. And I use that, particularly when I've got the Gates Glidden 2 down in the canal, I use it in a circumferential manner around the walls of the canal, just like I would use a headstone file. Because you want to get the gutta perker off the walls of the canal. So the actual sizes, as I said, depend on the, the canal the size that you've judged from the radiograph and looking at it, at the tooth itself, and it depends on the, the curvature of the tooth root as to how far down you go. The further you can go, the easier the whole treatment becomes, but just don't force it. Then once we've um, gone as far as we can with the Gates Glidden, which in most cases is probably getting to you know, at least half, but quite often say two thirds of the way down the canal, that's when I'll start to use a solvent 
with files. Now, my preferred solvent is eucalyptus, and we're really lucky in Australia. Eucalyptus is, is readily available and it's cheap. Um, um, and, and yeah, I really